the equipment ready. Yes, it's ready. Just waiting to be loaded. What about the food supplies? The food? Partially ready. Most of the food is usually purchased on the day we head out. Does anyone have any questions? Well then, go on, Mr. Prohorov. Well, my friends, our current raid is dedicated to inspecting a specific object. A specific ship. It's an English artillery destroyer that was intentionally remade as a mine layer. For the mine laying purpose, one gun was removed from the ship, the bottom one, and side rails and extension platforms for laying mines were installed. Roman Prokhorov is an underwater archaeologist. Not a single dive of the underwater research center happens without him. He's introducing us to the objectives, plans, and primary object of the upcoming expedition. The extension platforms can clearly be seen here. You mean that the aft end hit the bottom with its keel? It went down on its keel and this part turned over, yes. The aft end has never been inspected. Our task is to dive and confirm that the object is actually Vittoria. But I think there's no doubt about that. We shall also capture some photos and videos. But prior to that, we'll carry out a detailed hydrocaustic survey. And, well, maybe we'll raise something from the bottom for the museum. But that's only a tertiary objective. While we're getting ready, a couple of words about the object of our research. This is the British V-class destroyer Victoria. 25 such ships were commissioned by the Royal Navy between 1917 and 1918. At the same time, 21 destroyers of the W-class also entered service. The only difference between the two classes was that the latter had two additional torpedo tubes. These ships became as much of a signature for the development of destroyers as the famous Dreadnought was for battleships. Having embodied the best design solutions of the previous two decades, the V&W classes became examples for destroyer designs in the British Royal Navy and navies of other countries for the next 20 years. Destroyer Victoria was laid down in 1917 and had the following parameters. Length, 95 meters. Beam, 8.9 meters. Draft, 3.6 meters. Total displacement, 1,490 tons. To learn more about the structure of the ship and her features, I talked to the content group lead of World of Warships, Anton Minazetdinov. Anton, I know that we have Tier 3 Destroyer Valkyrie in the game, and we can say that Victoria and her are quite similar ships. Can you tell us about the technical features of these ships? It's true that these two ships belong to a single class, and they are very similar to each other. By contrast with Victoria, Valkyrie has a wider fore-end superstructure. A slightly higher foremast, her main mast is mounted slightly farther toward her aft, and she has more space between her torpedo launchers to allow for the installation of an extra compass. In addition, the advanced armament mounting layout was first applied to the ships of this class. Here, we can see the linear elevated mounting layout that allowed for greater firing accuracy at almost any course angle. Vittoria also had a 76mm anti-aircraft gun installed. So, at the same exact spot on Valkyrie, a pom-pom is mounted, right? Yeah, that's right. This area also holds two twin torpedo launchers. In 1917, 12 V-class destroyers, including Vittoria, were remade into mine layers. What does it mean? The rear mount and this torpedo launcher were removed. At these spots on both sides, rails were installed that ended in mine laying chutes. How many mines did Victoria carry, actually? 60. They were stored in place of the removed hardware. It's worth noting that the possibility to revert these ships back into standard destroyers within 24 hours was preserved. As a modified mine layer, the ship was armed with three 102mm QF Mark V guns, one 76mm Mark III anti-aircraft gun, one 7.62mm Maxim portable machine gun, and one 533mm twin torpedo launcher. Top cruising speed, 32 knots. Cruising range, 3,500 miles at a 15 knot speed. Crew, 134 persons. Victoria entered service as a fast mine layer in March 1918. However, until the end of World War I, the ship was part of the 11th destroyer fleet within the Grand Fleet and served as light forces. In 
In the summer of 2021, together with the Sonar Search Group of the Underwater Research Center, we journey to the place where destroyer Vittoria fell. Around 7 a.m., we set up from Nevar River in St. Petersburg. By noon, we had passed Kronstadt and left Nevar Bay, informally named the Marquis Puddle, by officers of the Baltic Fleet as a joke about the Russian naval minister of that time, Marquis de Traverse. During his administration, the fleet rarely sailed farther out than Kronstadt. The British squadron was sent here in December 1918 to support the Baltic countries that had just gained their independence. In their fight against the Bolsheviks, their task was to block the Baltic fleet within approximately the same boundaries. The British ships repeatedly shelled the coastal flank of the Red Army and laid mines close to Kronstadt and at the strategically important sea areas near the southern coastline of the Gulf of Finland. One such area was Koporia Bay, close to which the small and uninhabited island of Seskar is located. This island is the final destination of our journey. We arrived at the destination point. The island of Seskar is 1.5 miles behind me, while somewhere below us, at the depth of 30 meters, British destroyer Victoria lies on the bottom. We'll determine her exact location using sonar. multi-beam echo sounder that we are using has an extremely high resolution. The specialists tell us that by using this device, we can not only see all the rivets on a ship's hull, but also count them in real time if necessary. The green thing is the bottom, right? What's the depth? It is, but it's somewhat too bright. Here is our object. Here it is. Vittoria. To obtain a higher quality sonogram and get more information, we need to pass above the object a couple of times while trying to keep the direction of the boat's movement as accurate as possible. Yes, turn around port side and go back. Here you can see, yeah. Here we have void areas. Is it a shadow? Well, basically, yeah. So if we now pass above the object, for example, along a perpendicular course on our way back, we'll fill out these void spots. Just by looking at the sonogram alone, we can make out some structural elements that are specific to destroyer Vittoria. These are the mentioned mine-laying chutes that are sometimes called crinolines. The aft end is lying on its keel, while the rest of the hull is turned upside down, and we can see that it's heavily covered with sand and bottom sediment. The ship had lain here for almost a century before she was found by amateur divers in 2013. The sunken destroyer has been studied in detail by the Underwater Research Center of the Russian Geographical Society since 2018. Two months after we carried out the sonar survey, we returned here to the island of Seskar on board special boat Akvanoft, where the divers were getting ready for another dive down to the destroyer. The head of the group was executive director of the center, Sergei Forkin, an experienced scientific diver. Why do you use this boat exactly? What are her advantages? We don't only use this boat, but when we sail out to the Baltic Sea to conduct some serious diving operations rather than a single dive, this boat is extremely convenient. First of all, this is a catamaran, so the boat has a more or less stable structure for short waves. The catamaran structure allows us to utilize a large working space at the rear. Because we're currently working in a light mode per se, I mean, we're just observing and not performing any work, there are only the personal belongings of the divers here. So is this place usually a mess? When our work involves ground abrasion, you will see pumps, hoses lying in rings and other equipment here. It never hurts to have more room. 
The only downside of the boat is her speed. For example, if we need to dive to an object using this motorboat, we depart from the shore, dive and happily return home in the evening. The cruising speed of this vessel is 6 knots, around 11 kilometers per hour. It takes forever to get to any object. That's why it's pointless to utilize this vessel for a single dive. If an expedition is long, do you basically live here? Basically, yes. It's our expeditionary base. The guys live in here, eat in here and work right in here as well. You wake up in the morning, and you're already at work. The main aim of expeditions carried out by the center is to collect data for a register of sunken ships and other underwater objects of the historical and cultural heritage of the Russian Federation. Vitoria was added to the register in 2020 after two years had been spent on research activities. You can find a detailed description of how the destroyer was preserved at the moment the description was composed. We met the author of the register, Andrei Lukoshkov, on board Akvanoft. While the divers were getting ready to submerge and passing their medical checks, Andrei Andrei Lukoshkov told us about the events that had happened here in 1919. It was the summer of 1919. The task of the British fleet was to block the Soviet fleet within the borders of Neva Bay. The British laid minefields that should have destroyed the ships of the Soviet fleet. The Soviets lacked coal and combat crews. Many sailors had been sent to the front line. The Soviets weren't able to prepare many ships for combat. By the end of summer 1919, they were able to get one submarine ready. The submarine managed to enter the sea and tried to attack patrol ships of the British fleet, which were controlling the way out of Neva Bay. That submarine was Puntera, helmed by Alexander Bukhtin, the former lieutenant of the Russian Imperial Navy who continued his service in the Red Navy of the Soviet Republic after the revolution. It was a Bars-class submarine designed by naval engineer Ivan Bubnov before World War I. Puntera was commissioned in 1916. The sub had a single hull structure, her length was 68 meters, displacement while submerged, 780 tons, maximum underwater cruising speed, 8.5 knots. The operating diving depth was 45 meters. The maximum diving depth was 90 meters. The sub didn't have watertight bulkheads, which made her more prone to sinking if damaged. On the other hand, it was convenient for her commander to helm the sub when he could keep his entire crew of 45 persons in sight. The sub's armament comprised four for 50 mm torpedo launchers, two on the bow end, two on the aft. The first pair of divers have already finished their work. They attached a buoy to the object. How does it work? Basically, we attach a rope to our object. We'll use it to continue our work so we don't just dive to a random spot at the bottom. Because even if we dive for these 20-something meters, the current can move us away. We can get lost. It's hard to navigate underwater in zero visibility conditions. That's why, even if we know that we're currently right above our object, but just dive in, we would be most likely to miss our object and end up at some random spot at the bottom. We would have to waste a lot of time just to find our objects in this situation. That's why we have the rope that will lead us directly to our object so we won't miss it. We'll grab onto it and use it as our guide. We'll travel to our object like trolley buses traveling along power lines. Four of us will go, two of us will be working, the other two will be shooting. It takes two people to capture good shots underwater. One diver with a camera and one with a light source. The thing is, is that there's always something in the water like mud, dregs. If we point our light source directly at the camera, 
We'll light up everything that's directly in front of the camera and we won't see a thing actually. That's why we need to spread the camera and a light source. Either you mount a meter long arm on the camera that makes it as if the light is coming from the side or, what's more correct, we have a cameraman at one spot and another guy holds a light source at some other spot, always at some angle. So they highlight an object, but not the drugs in front of it. Despite the fact that the Underwater Research Center had been working on the sunken Victoria since 2018 and has examined the destroyer pretty well, each new dive requires a fresh and detailed plan. That's why we've probed the ship with the sonar. The soil is silt, the wind force is one. Current? Zero, zero, 005. I prefer diving in cold water. It isn't cold, it's icy. It's pretty hard to navigate because this part is very chaotic. It's made of parts of the plating, frames and some ship mechanisms. There are definitely pieces of a turbine, pieces of steam pipes, a chaotic mess on the whole. That's where our safety line goes. Here, the stem can clearly be seen. It initially fell here. Then we moved it and moored it to this structure. Here, two or three meters from it, you can clearly see on the sonogram that this is just a torn off piece of the whole side. Here are its portholes, frames. It sticks out about 1.5 meters from the soil. So she's lying on her internal hull side? Internal. Internal. She's not lying upward, she's lying vertically, like that. Right, she's like that. It would be interesting to go down along the safety line and inspect the stem structure, because it's an unusual one. It has like a proto-bulbous bow, mm -hmm. looks like a tooth. There's no deck as such. As for the things that can be identified, these are, perhaps, an artillery porthole, rails for bogey cars. The rails can be seen here, right? We can guess that these are rails. Hmm, we can guess. It's impossible to get a complete picture after just two or three dives. We're mainly speculating what the state of the ship is, what we can find on the ship, what we can't, etc. Our task is to transform these speculations into facts. It's possible for an object to be entirely without a name, but its condition, the number of artifacts it holds, and the volume of history that one could obtain from it make it a Klondike. That's why we always need to look for some kind of balance between a ship's heroic past and harsh present. After we have collected the materials for the Underwater Research Center, documents and data from historical sources, and the memoirs of Alexander Bakhtin, we can now reconstruct the events that happened on August 31st, 1919, to a sufficient degree of credibility. Commander Bakhtin, at the helm of the submarine Pantera, took a course 260 degrees to the northern part of Seskar Island. We have his detailed reports the tracing plan of his course, the plan of his attack, and the plan of where his submarine traveled. While doing our research, we restore the events as they happened, in reality. This is what Bakhtin wrote on Pantera that day in his memoirs. It's been six hours since we submerged. We're moving at the periscope depth of 24 feet. The propellers hum monotonously in the aft end. General quarters, the signal. Action stations. At 2.30 p.m., the commander spotted a destroyer with four funnels. It was Abdil, which was patrolling Caporia Bay together with Victoria. Pantera observed the ship for half an hour until she lost her in a hazy mist above water. Radio check. Come in. Loud and clear. At 5 p.m., the submarine spotted Abdil traveling along a parallel course again.
But due to sea disturbance that was forcing the submarine to the surface, it was difficult to hold Pantera at the periscope depth. So Bakhtin decided to dive deeper. At 5.50 p.m., the commander raised the periscope to make sure that the ship was moving along the same course. Ten minutes later, the submarine spotted another destroyer that had two funnels and was close to the first one. The submarine continued watching the ships by ascending to periscope depth from time to time. In the evening of August 31st, 1919, Bakhtin ordered the torpedoes in the bow launchers to be set to a depth of two meters and started moving Pantera to an attack position after he spotted that the British ships had dropped their anchors. He directed the submarine to move to the shore at a low speed. At 9 p.m., he turned the sub so they would be able to submerge without changing their course after they had attacked the ships anchored in shallow water. It was also important to attack the destroyers from the side of the sunset. The submarine was in a highly difficult position. Sand ridges were forcing Pantera to keep to a shallow depth of around 12 meters, where any strong sea disturbance could raise the submarine to the surface, and she would be immediately detected by the British. By that time, the submarine had been moving to the position for more than two hours already by slowly sneaking up to their enemies. At 9.19 p.m., Bakhtin gave the order to launch two torpedoes from the bow launcher, one after another, from a distance of around 400 meters. The officer of the watch on board Victoria, Charles Bacon, was on the bridge making the final navigational computations before darkness set in when suddenly he spotted a periscope 350 meters off to starboard. To his horror, he also saw the wakes of two torpedoes. Bacon shouted as loud as he could, Green, 45, load! That meant target to starboard. The course angle is 45 degrees. It was too late, however. The first torpedo passed 30 meters in front of the ship, and the second hit the destroyer near the aft engine room. The gunners on board the damaged destroyer tried to open fire in the direction specified by the officer of the watch, but the ship listed and started sinking, enveloped in a cloud of smoke and steam. It's hard to navigate because there is a very chaotic, formless field of fragments, a large number of empty boxes, shoes and some small household items that were once inside these boxes are scattered in the soil. The visibility here is about two meters, but the seabed layer is one meter thick, maybe even less, and there is almost no current. I mean, we almost always work by feel. You can't see nothing. You can't see your partner if they move just a little too far away. If they turn their flashlights away from you, you can't see them. Sure, the conditions influence our working methods and qualification requirements for our divers, as well as their vigilance and readiness. called in his memoirs. Immediately after the submarine had been forced to the surface, he ordered his crew to run to the bow end in order to create extra trim. After gaining ballast, the submarine disappeared underwater like a stone. Pantera soon reached the bottom and was almost crawling away from the attack position. quickly rise from the bottom and move to the Shepielovsky lighthouse, keeping a depth of 80 feet at all times. A couple of minutes after, I get the guidebook with ships from around the world. I find the square with the photo of the destroyer, take scissors and scissor the photo out of the book. The people around me know what that means. Thus, I'm getting rid of the dead ship. At 1 a.m., we reached the minefield. We didn't risk going farther. 
He put our submarine on the seabed at a depth of 94 feet for the night and slept until 6.30 a.m. We slept with the thought that some other commander on an enemy ship would act in the same way, cold and unemotional, when they got out their book and scissors, found our Pantera in it, and with just a single movement of their hand would remove our dead ship from his book. The submarine surfaced near the harbor of Kronstadt. She had stayed underwater for a total of 30 hours and 10 minutes. There was a curious case on September 25, 1944. A patrol boat detected a metal hull exactly at this spot at the bottom. They decided that it was an enemy submarine and they dropped some bombs on her. So air and fuel were leaking for the next three days. Then a diver was sent to take a look. It looked like a submarine. And they forgot about it. In the 21st century, when active work related to searching for ships began and the corresponding equipment appeared, we found nine ships from various time periods here. Two ships from World War II, some ships from the Imperial Age, and even some wooden ships. So we detected the ship and started inspecting her. There was another expedition recently that determined the degree of the ship's preservation. The divers will tell you more about that. The object is pretty badly destroyed. I'm not talking about the destruction caused by enemy hits or the ship hitting the bottom. I mean time decay. Underwater objects don't decay in a linear fashion. An object decays by 10% during the first year underwater, by 20% next year, by 30% the year after that, and so on. So they decay exponentially. Objects can remain in quite good condition for a long time, then every part of them comes to ruin. And that time has already come for Vittoria. It's probably related to material fatigue? Yes, it accumulates. You can tear the plating apart with your bare hands. Whatever you grab onto will slowly crumble right in your hands. At least ships of the 20th century, they can be dangerous because of the following two things. The first thing is the ammo ships had on board explosives. After all, it was a destroyer that carried mines on board. Plus, some ships used oil to sail. We can even look up the details. The ship had 367 tons of oil in her tanks. The oil polluted the soil. Currently, secondary pollution is underway. So the polluted soil is polluting the water and soil nearby. I, for instance, know of seven such ships with oil tanks. They're all lying here in our waters. We've completely inspected the bow end from the fissure to the stem. We found several interesting things. A couple of portals. If the issue of raising something for a museum comes up, we'll have something to get from Vittoria. The portholes are great because of their quality and sturdiness. Even if the hull around them decays completely, the porthole is preserved quite well. This frame exactly. It's made of another metal, isn't it? Yes, it's made from a non-ferrous metal. Yes, a non-ferrous one. I think it's brass. We found several personal items. We found a small box that belonged to a sailor. The box has the sailor last name and initial letters of the first name engraved. We've inspected a great deal. We went to the engine room and judging by the fragments, we've inspected much around the control cabin area. Unfortunately, any cavities that may contain something of interest are caved in with splinters, oxides and fallen off corrosion. I mean, in order to find something there, we need to dig for that. Dig again, again and again. It looks more like some kind of underwater archaeology. Basically, that's exactly the underwater archaeology. It just can be divided into its light version when we find something and raise it from the bottom, conserve it, renovate it and so on. And sure thing, there is archaeology that requires some ground abrasion work. In our case, it's not the ground. These are just materials that fell off the ship. 
Alexander Bakhtin, the commander of Pantera, was awarded the Order of the Red Banner for sinking destroyer Victoria. It was the first victory of the Soviet underwater fleet. The peace negotiations between the USSR and Estonia that started in December 1919 made the presence of the British fleet in the Gulf of Finland pointless. By the end of the month, the last British ships had left the Gulf. In their turn, the British side held the commander of the 20th Destroyer Flotilla, Captain Berry Curtis, responsible for the sinking of Victoria because he had ordered the ships to anchor in dangerous waters before darkness fell. However, taking the former merits of Captain Curtis into account, the commander of the Baltic Squadron, Admiral Cowan, decided not to punish the captain and just sent a short message to the Admiralty. A Bolshevik submarine has sunk Victoria. I'm sorry. Well, the ship isn't scary. She isn't dark. That's something slightly esoteric. Sure. Yes, some objects could be really dark. Everything sort of works properly. You're sort of confident in yourself and your partner. But there is some feeling of anxiety present. That feeling that everything will suddenly break. Everything is fine. But the feeling is depressive. Here we have a very interesting object. It's not scary. It really inspires us to study it. By inspecting sunken ships, you start to understand the history of naval battles. The legendary museum ships that have been preserved until our time and undoubtedly deserved their high status are often perceived as popular city sites and rightfully considered unique memorials of naval history. But when you set out on an expedition to a sunken ship, you find yourself basically on a battlefield, even though the battle happened many years ago. This understanding that came to us on board the vessel of the Underwater Research Center near the island of Seskar helped us a lot during our work on this film. In this film, we tried not to just tell you the story of Destroyer Victoria and restore the circumstances of her fall, but also answer the question, why do researchers go down to the cold and alien world of the sea depths and light their way in the darkness to search for ships that disappeared dozens of years ago? If our work is interesting to you, let us know.